In our last episode on New Netherland, I left you hanging. Peter Stuyvesant against the world, essentially. The English fleet in his harbor, his own men refusing to fight, the militias turned against him, his own citizens in the city of New Amsterdam wanting him to capitulate to the English. But nonetheless, there he stood ready to fight. He was the last man to believe in New Netherland. And finally, he himself decided to surrender the colony. And at this point, any sane man would have surrendered the colony. The people themselves didn't want Stuyvesant to put up a fight. There was nothing left to protect. And he had his own family on the island of Manhattan. A peaceful surrender would guarantee the best odds of Stuyvesant maintaining the safety of his family and his friends, as much as you could have friends in a position he was in, and uh, personal property. The actual transfer of the colony occurred at Stuyvesant's own house. This is where New York and New Jersey were born. They were born in Stuyvesant's house. New Netherland is now dead, and now we have New York and New Jersey. In the terms of the transfer, there is a promise that these new colonies would have freedom of religion. And so the Church of England would not be the official church of these colonies. There would be no official church. This is groundbreaking. Think about this. Have we, have we learned about this before? Have we heard about a colony at any point up to this point that was free from a governing church body? Nope. Starts right here. The terms also specify that there would be no conscription of the citizens inside of New York and New Jersey as the Dutch colonists were worried about being involved in English-French back-and-forth affairs, as now the North American continent would have Spain far to the south, and then the English on the coast, and the French far north and on the interior. And so they had the, the foresight to realize, oh, now the French and English are going to come to blows. And they were right, they do come to blows. Officers of the colony could pledge an oath to the King of England, and thereby be renewed as officials of now New York. New Amsterdam, of course, became New York City. Fort Amsterdam changed to Fort James. And all of the white inhabitants of the entirety of New Netherland were given the title of free denizens. A denizen not quite having the rights of a citizen. You don't have guaranteed access to a representative government, but you are a free being who's living in this colony and you have some certain rights to your own person and property. And now these details are typically it when they talk about the transfer of power from the Netherlands to England of this entire area. Basically what's going to become the middle colonies of the 13 colonies you learned about in middle school. Now this is pretty much it. They act like it was a completely peaceful takeover. In fact, books will tell you explicitly that's all it was. It was just some paperwork and the whole colony just flipped over. Some of the colonists thought, hey, we might switch back to the Netherlands in a couple years. Who knows? And there was no resistance happily ever after. Not the case! You have been lied to, and I'm here to tell you the truth. Of course, Stuyvesant didn't push things into a military encounter. That didn't happen. He signed papers signing over the colony, but now the documentation gets fuzzy. The reports get fuzzy, because when things happen that people don't want to admit to later on, they tend not to write them down. There is some evidence that further up the Hudson River, there was some resistance to the English forces rolling in. Of course, Manhattan might be surrendered, but when the English boats start going upstream, people at Fort Orange might be a little surprised to see them. So there was some resistance up that way. And the details on that are fuzzy, but it wasn't completely peaceful. And now the town around Fort Orange, called Beverwick, becomes Albany, based on another name for Scotland, which the Duke of York also had title in. Albany, New York, arises. The town of Wiltschwick, built around the Esopus, eventually turns into the city of Kingston. It is purposely renamed. And many of the Dutch names stay in place. However, a lot of the downstate names eventually turn into English interpretations of the original meaning, or just English renderings of how the Dutch sounded to English ears. So you have places like Young Kiers, where Adrian van der Donk set up his little farm. That eventually becomes Yonkers. Which is a lot easier to say if you're an English speaker. Lang Eland eventually becomes Long Island. Excuse my Dutch pronunciation. And then we have places like Brooklyn, which becomes Brooklyn. Harlem, which becomes Harlem. Of course, Staten Eland becomes Staten Island. Vlessing becomes Flushing. 
And for every one that changed over to something more English sounding, there were two or three that just stayed as they were. And we'll dabble a little more into that later on. Anyway, records indicate that the initial English fleet that went upriver to seize the rest of the northern part of the colony kept to the terms that Stuyvesant laid out. It was a, a relatively peaceful takeover with some resistance until they realized what the news was from Manhattan Island. However, the portion of the fleet that found their way to the southern part of the colony, to what is now the area around the Delaware River, exhibited drastically different behavior, New Amstel being the prime example. Now remember, in our past episodes, when we talked about New Amstel, it's confusing, and it was even confusing in Stuyvesant's time, who was actually in control of this area of New Netherland? Because it was sold specifically to the city of Amsterdam. Now, would it be a subsidiary of New Netherland, whereby New Amsterdam would share in a greater amount of the profits, but it would still be part of the colony? Or was it itself its own colony? Now, we don't need to get into that now. But whatever happened there, there's varying reports that New Amstel didn't offer resistance. And then there's other sources that say they did offer some resistance. New Amstel did not receive the same terms that Stuyvesant received. The fort at New Amstel, also called Fort Amstel, they weren't very creative then, was leveled by the English. And all the settlers around the fort were run off into the woods. Sources again are sparse on this. There's, there's one particular source that claims that some of the men were even captured and sold into some early form of indentured servitude or even slavery. And to tie this all back in Svanendale on the Delaware is completely destroyed. It was a utopian settlement. I did a whole episode on it. Just go back one, two, or three episodes. It's in there somewhere. Gone. Utopia destroyed by the English. And again, we don't know exactly why. We don't know if they put up a struggle or if they didn't put up a struggle. But again, this fleet of English who went south of Manhattan just had a field day with taking over New Netherland. It was not humane. It was not peaceful. You have been lied to. And again, I know you're getting tired of me saying this, but the sources are very sparse because nobody wanted to write this stuff down. It's, not, it's, it's, it's controversial. The years, the years immediately after the capitulation of New Netherland and it turning into mostly New York and New Jersey, scattering of other places, there were revolts. There were rebellions. It's reported in 1667, the Espis settlers, now in the town of Kingston, rebelled against English rule. At the same time, after Stuyvesant capitulated, there were riots in what is now New York City and the town of Bergen. And so we can't know the ferocity of these rebellions, the effectiveness, the, the how widespread they were. But it's safe to say that for some remnant of the population of New Netherland, becoming an English possession was not preferred and it wasn't easy. But for the Netherlands, losing New Netherland was not that big of a deal. Remember that the colony still existed as a possession of the Dutch West India Company. It was still meant to be a business asset, at least on paper. And the colony as a whole, if you put the highest estimates for its population, around 10,000 in 1664, against the population of the Netherlands at the time, it's a loss of less than 1% of their population, which at this time, a plague would easily add up to. So th this, was, this was less than an outbreak of cholera or smallpox to them. For the Dutch West India Company itself, New Netherland at best at this point was a lost leader. It provided some food to these wonderful like, islands in the West Indies where they could enslave people and ex extract cash crops to make tons of money. Terrible, horrible practice. But after this point, the Dutch West India Company wipes their hand of New Netherland and starts to focus more on the slave trade. And so, the one colony they cared the least about was probably their least objectionable colony in the entire history of the Dutch West India Company. So honestly, good riddance, the area of New York, New Jersey, parts of Pennsylvania, Delaware, and even pieces of Maryland are better off not being part of the Dutch West India Company after this point as they take their dark turn. But in the 1670s, the Dutch very briefly retook New Netherland for less than a year. And then when they again made a peace agreement with England, everything went back. And so New Netherland existed for a couple decades, 
all the podcasts we've covered up to this point on New Netherland, and then it existed for a brief flash of time, and then it disappeared again. And during that flash of time, everything was just kind of at a standstill. So there's not much to say there. So everything went back to Dutch rule, and then before you knew it, it went right back to English rule. And with that, in 1674, in the Treaty of Westminster, the Dutch were officially done with the mid-coast of the Atlantic. They were done trying to retake New Netherland or to even continue to claim New Netherland. It was over. But let's turn back now to our protagonist in this whole story, if there could ever be one, Peter Stuyvesant himself. Obviously, after the surrender of the colony, he has to go back to the Netherlands and explain what happened. Now, before he was even the director general of New Netherland, he had been in this position before. He had to go back to the Netherlands at a certain point to explain why his siege of an island in the West Indies failed. And that's the siege where he lost his leg. And he was offered retirement at that point because they recognized that the failure of the siege was not due to his effort or his tactics. It just was what it was. Now, at this point, Peter Stuyvesant is back in the Netherlands, having to explain the surrender of 10,000 souls over to the English. I imagine Peter Stuyvesant at this point doesn't much care about what people think about him in terms of reputation, especially in the Netherlands, a place he had barely ever lived his adult life in. And so whatever transpired at this point, Peter Stuyvesant shrugged it off. And believe it or not, he ended up settling permanently down on the island of Manhattan. You could say he became the first resident of New York City. Peter Stuyvesant had served the company in Brazil, in the West Indies, and now in North America. And he'd been gone from the Netherlands for such a long time. Really, the only times he showed up there was to explain his failures. He was a stranger there, and people probably didn't look at him as a person who was to be respected. He had a peg leg, he was advancing in years, and it definitely showed. In the Netherlands, he was a loser. He was a nobody. He was a stranger. But in New York City, it said, even little children, years after the surrender of the colony, would refer to him as general or governor. Signs of respect. He was a sign of the old ways. People still looked up to him. People remembered when he was in power. And he still carried a little flame of that power around with him. And so Stuyvesant maintained his family and his farm and lived out his golden years as an English subject. And while it's been reported that he was politically quiet after that point, being retired and essentially put away from any public service, the Stuyvesant family didn't remain down for long. And now we're going to return to this subject later in the podcast, but the leading families of New Netherland made sure that they were among the leading families of the English New York and New Jersey, and eventually the leading families of the United States. But we'll turn to that subject in due time. I want to end this part on Peter Stuyvesant with a quote from the great Russell Shorto from his book, Island at the Center of the World. It's a quote on Stuyvesant, obviously, otherwise why would I read it? Had a lesser man been given the commission to strengthen the Dutch hold over their North American territories, the English would have swept in decades sooner. So rather than Peter Stuyvesant being a failure, he was the only thing keeping that colony together at least in the last 10 years of his rule. And most certainly without Stuyvesant, the English probably would have taken over one way or another during the first Anglo-Dutch war. Now let's turn to bigger subjects. The push on the colonial end to take over New Netherland mostly came from the New England colonies. Now, if we back up the timeline, we come to a strange moment in history when we realize that the Pilgrim separatists who are sometimes, sometimes called Brownists, uh, many of them originally took refuge in the Netherlands. And there were talks of those separatists in the Netherlands being the original founders, uh, settlers of the colony of New Netherland. But instead, those separatists would eventually be folded into the Plymouth colony, the beginning of New England, in other words. I know this sounds convoluted, but basically the Netherlands at one point harbored the destruction of New Netherland, as they had these separatists who would be the seeds of New England in their mists, and instead of settling them within their own dominion, sent them 
well, didn't send them, but allowed them to go back to England, where they eventually left and formed New England. And so in a weird twist of fate, the Netherlands themselves put into motion the destruction of their own colonial possessions. But in a reverse twist of fate, comes 1688, 1689, the Catholic King of England, very unpopular, James II is deposed, along with his son, and replaced by the invading Prince of Orange, royal leader of the Netherlands states, William and his wife Mary. And they become the English rulers, William and Mary. And the two countries coexist in personal union just because of their shared monarch. So the Netherlands harbored the destruction of New Netherland by harboring the seeds of New England. And then soon after that, the Netherlands itself, the leader of the Netherlands, their royal leader anyway, goes and takes over England. And under the reign of William and Mary, we see a lot of the English documents, like the English Bill of Rights, passed that will eventually fold into ideas of our own American Revolution. And so traditional histories will say, okay, the Netherlands lost, the English won, New Netherland was given up, uh, New England pushed in. Uh, but then when you really start to think about it, you realize there's so many twists and turns, there's really no winners, and what happens in the end is it all blends together. And that's kind of the legacy of New Netherland, how it ended up blending into America. But before I get into this delicious blend, I want to speak about the parts of New Netherland that didn't fit in so nicely. The parts that remained, the parts that lingered. And usually when people talk about the legacy of New Netherland, they talk about these things. Like, oh, how long were Dutch speakers still to be found in the Mohawk Valley or down in New Jersey? How, how long did Dutch culture persist before being fully Americanized and homogenized. So after the English takeover of New Netherland, the Dutch-speaking citizens of the new colonies did not just stop being Dutch. They didn't stop speaking Dutch. They didn't stop adhering to Dutch customs. They continued to live their lives. And historians over the years have uncovered just how long that Dutchness prevailed. And it's far longer than you would think. In the cities, the powerful families found their way into the powerful English families moving in, and they continued to essentially be the rulers of these colonies. But out in the country, the Dutchness seems to be have been preserved for an extremely long time. That's where they took root in the deep hollows of upstate New York and the backwoods of New Jersey. Over a hundred years after the English takeover, around the time of the American Revolution, there were still towns where the majority language spoken all up through New Jersey, up into New York, were Dutch. There were times when sheriffs would have trouble putting together a jury of English speakers so everyone knew what was going on. Back in the 1740s, the Swedish explorer and, and chronicler, Peter Kalm, he noticed when he was in the Hudson Valley that they were overwhelmingly Dutch still, and that there was very little sign that he was in an English possession. He noticed it wasn't just the language, but also their manners that were resoundingly Dutch. And this would be 80 years after the English takeover. The cities, as I mentioned, gave way to English culture faster. Although the Dutch population remained there, they had just been fully Anglicized. Their last Dutch service, though, was all the way in 1764. A hundred years after the English takeover, New York City itself was still conducting Dutch reform services in Dutch. So while the Metropolitan Dutch gave way to English culture faster, they still held on to it for a very long time, three or four generations. And outside of New York City, again, there were still majority Dutch-speaking populations. In fact, the Declaration of Independence needed to be translated into Dutch for many New Yorkers to read it. The linguist Nicolijn van der Sij says that in the period 1750 to 1800, Dutch was still the majority language in places like Albany and Kingston, which of course used to be Beverwick and Wiltschwick. And George Washington himself, in his own time, referred to the Hudson River all the way down to the Raritan River as the Dutch Belt. And so the Dutch hold, uh, culturally, linguistically, over this area that was formerly New Netherland, wasn't just in the backwoods. When, we, when it comes to the 18th century, the Dutch still had a hold over everything outside the largest municipalities, again, New York City and the surrounding areas. 
but you go up to Albany and it was still very much a Dutch town. And many of these places still kept records in Dutch. In fact, contrary to everything I would have thought before embracing this subject, Vandersij says, and, and I quote, In the last quarter of the 18th century, the number of Dutch speakers on the American East Coast was probably at its highest. And then she goes on to say, New York and New Jersey would account for 100,000 speakers alone. And these would be primary speakers, of course, not people who had a familiarity with Dutch or spoke Dutch as a second language. And so here we are over 100 years after England takes the colony, and we see more Dutch speakers now than there were 100 years ago. How is that possible? Well, in many areas, Dutch was the lingua franca. It's how you communicated, got along in the world, and conducted business. Even between the colonies and the Haudenosaunee, Dutch was the language that the Mohawk especially learned to communicate with the white man with. And so between multiplying offspring and the usefulness, Dutch was at its peak in North America a hundred years after the Dutch left North America. That being said, around the time of the American Revolution is when it started to wane a little bit. And the reasons are many. But one reason is Dutch was seen as backward. It was the folk tradition, it was the old ways. It was increasingly seen as the ways of the country, not the ways of the city. And so even those who are ethnically Dutch, if they wanted to appear upper class, if they wanted to be fancy, if they wanted to be metropolitan, they would abandon their Dutch customs and language and embrace the English way. And so at this point, we see the slow and steady retreat of Dutch to the backwoods, to the country. And so school teachers slowly stopped teaching in Dutch, or at least solely in Dutch, started adopting English, and then over time eventually, they were English only. The same thing slowly happened with the churches, especially the Dutch Reformed Church. Inevitably, English took over. And yet van der Sij claims that in the early 19th century, so the 1800s, there were roughly 250,000 people in what was now the United States who could read Dutch, which meant that the 100,000 speakers of Dutch 25, 30, 40 years before that point in time, had children, and obviously they multiplied, as all creatures do. And even in the 1800s, you still had 250,000 people who could at least understand Dutch, or read most of it on paper. But the tides were turning, and if you wanted to conduct business, get ahead in the world, or just get by in the world, you would need to do it in the English language. Nicolein van der Sij, again, a source that I love to use, she points out a, a notice in the 1807 Catskill Recorder, which I think was a periodical newspaper, so there was a lot of them in 1807. Well, one particular edition had an ad for employment in the paper, and it said, No Dutchman need apply, and yes, he is pretty well Yankified. The odd part in there, of course, is that the word Yankee is, itself is probably of Dutch origin. <laughs> but here we are in 1807, and unless you can understand orders given to you in English, they don't want to employ you anymore. They can't accommodate the fact that you don't speak the English language. And as the 19th century rolled on, there were less and less native speakers of Dutch. And even in the deep backwoods and back roads, Dutch would be slowly transitioning from the primary language of these people to their secondary language, their familial language, the language spoken at home, or maybe only when you saw grandma or grandpa. And yet, it is known that there were native Dutch speakers in America. So not people who migrated from the Netherlands, coming here at some later date, people who learned the Dutch that was spoken in New Netherland or a descendant of the Dutch spoken in New Netherland in the United States right until the 20th century, the century I was born in, being only scantily documented at the very end of its existence. The Dutch language of New Netherland as it survived into the 18th, 19th and 20th century diverged into Jersey Dutch and Mohawk Valley Dutch. Van der Sij claims that the last group of Dutch speakers would have been born in the 1880s and would have lived until about the 1960s. And that is the end of the road for Dutch as its own language in the United States. But now let's turn to things more positive because we often focus on how long did the colonial legacy of New Netherland linger on before it was absorbed. We've talked about this. Now let's flip the script. Let's see how 
The beginning of this American melting pot, one of its root ingredients, was New Netherland. Let's see how it blended in, and how it added to the taste palette of the stew, so to speak. Now, there are a bunch of sources for Dutch loan words that made it into American English. And I had to sift through, because there's a lot of, like, Dutch sailing words that made it into the English language in general. Meaning that it was a term that came up in the Netherlands and ended up in, let's say, Bristol, England. And now it's in the English language. That has nothing to do with New Netherland. So I, I made sure to sift through to find words that originated in the Netherlands or in New Netherland, ended up in New Netherland, and then became an American word before being passed on to British English or just staying in the Americas. So these are specifically word heritage of New Netherland settlers. The best source for this information is, of course, Nicoline van der Sij and her book, Cookies, Coastlaw, and Stoops. But the origin of these Americanisms are well known. So, let's go through it. The Dutch give us the word snuff, allegedly at least, for when you ground up tobacco and you shove it up your nose. Again, so when, <laughs> when uh, Europeans first encountered tobacco, they saw natives smoking it, and often they called it drinking smoke, because they didn't really have a, a smoking culture of any sort to rely on for vocabulary. Snuff became the word for shoving it up your nose. The word cookie, the word cookie is Dutch in origin, and it made its way into English through the descendants of the New Netherlands settlers in America. Now I could prove this, and you could demonstrate this, because if you go over to England, what do they call cookies over there? Biscuits. Ugh. Who wants a biscuit when you can have a cookie? So you like cookies? Thank the Dutch settlers of New Netherland and their descendants. On that same note, Krulers, delicious donut, you can get them at Dunkin' Donuts. Go ahead and buy one. The word dope, speck, noodles, snoop, waffle, and brandy. The word snoop in particular is also related to the word cookie because the original New Netherland use of the word snoop appears to be to eat sweets on the sly. So you might be snooping some cookies, and then that came to be associated with spying in general, or doing something you were not supposed to do, overhearing something you weren't supposed to hear. The word caboodle! That's originally Dutch, go figure! So next time somebody says the whole caboodle, you can say, oh, what, wait, what is a caboodle? Caboodle is in English, it's obvious, caboodle, that's nothing. It came over with the Dutch settlers. Here's a big word, the American English word boss. Now, if you watch the British version of The Office, their lead character is named, played by Ricky Gervais, his name is, what's his name? Oh my god, what's his name? David Brent. He is referred to as a manager. Whereas Michael Scott, the American lead of The American Office, is the boss. He's got a cup that says the word boss on it. World's greatest boss. Boss is originally a Dutch word, roughly pronounced boss. B-A-A-S, something like that. And it became the word for managers in the Mid-Atlantic region. And that's why when we see the word boss, we think of the boss, Bruce Springsteen, from New Jersey, with a Dutch last name. Coincidence? I don't know. You also think of the boss. You think of uh, Frank Sinatra, New York City. Every gritty movie where there's a boss. It's New York City, crime bosses. Boss is an American English word. And it comes to us from these Dutch settlers in New Netherland. Back to more subtle things, the word pinky. You like pinky fingers, you like pinky toes. How to get its name? It was the Dutch in America, go figure. The word duffel, a trade good that was often heavily desired by the Native Americans from the Dutch because it was lighter than um, skins and furs. And so they would use large like lengths of duffel to clothe themselves. And so that's where we get the word duffel. The word dingus. I'm sure you called your friend a dingus before. Dingus comes from Dutch. The word spook or spooky apparently came from the Dutch in New Netherland as it found its way from there into American English and only from American English did it go back to British English. So next time you feel spooked on Halloween, you can thank the Dutch. But that brings us to a much bigger, huger part of the mixing pot, the mixing, the, the soup we're making here. Christmas, you like Christmas? English Christmas used to be this this sad religious dark event that would be surrounded by ceremony and sanctimosity. I don't know if that's a word. Doesn't matter, I'm keeping it in. But Christmas as we know it today is this great celebration, the gift giving, you got Santa Claus, he's jolly, all that great stuff. 
that was a unique creation of the Dutch settlers who became citizens of the English colonies and eventually the United States, of having a slightly happier version of Christmas that originates in the Netherlands. These Dutch settlers would buy or make toys for their children. They'd put up stockings. They'd tell stories about Santa Claus. And, that, and that's exactly where we get, again, we call him St. Nicholas in the English language, but everyone calls him Santa Claus. And that comes from the Dutch pronunciation, something similar to Santa Claus, something like that. I'm not a genius at it, but you get the point that Santa Claus himself is a remnant of New Netherland. And so English school children who are going to school with these Dutch children would see the Dutch kids getting these presents and eating cookies and, and having a great time on Christmas while they're having an experience more like a, a Good Friday where they're going uh, to church services, they're reading the Bible, they're giving things up. It's a time for reflection and for purification. Meanwhile, the Dutch kids are having a grand old time. And from there, the American Christmas really started to boom. Of course, all of this would be further accentuated by the commercialism in the early 20th century. But the seeds of a really fun, awesome Christmas in the American continent originally came from these Dutch settlers in New Netherland. Thank you, Dutch settlers. Oh, and how can I have forgotten the term Yankee? There's nothing more American than Yankee, right? Uh, maybe maybe a, a bald eagle made out of apple pies. The word Yankee itself is probably derived from the term Yankees. So in the middle colonies, formerly New Netherland, there were a lot of Dutch people living up in the hills and the mountains and the valleys, and they developed a reputation for being country bumpkin types. And a lot of them were named Jan because it's the Dutch form of John. So there's a lot of them. And so Yankee became the term for these country, American country bumpkins. And then eventually it just became the term for all Americans, which the British saw as backward. Hence, when you get to the story of Yankee Doodle, well, the song of Yankee Doodle, he's riding into town on a donkey. He doesn't understand what macaroni style is. He's only good for women's work. Yankee was originally not a pleasant term. Of course, we Americans turned it around on them during the revolution. But at its root, it is referring to New Netherlanders. And so the most American word ever probably owes its origin to the legacy of New Netherland. So let's bring it back around to a talking point that I promise I get back to. Let's talk about these people in particular. Now, even to this day, there's still a Dutch Reformed Church in America. They just call themselves the Reformed Church of America. They're an offshoot of the Dutch Reformed Church. Let's get back to Stuyvesant's family. Wouldn't you know it, a couple generations laying low, his family was back in charge. There are governors of New York State who are the direct descendants of Peter Stuyvesant. So the, the influential Dutch families simply found their way into English families and continued to be in power. But let's keep going with specific individuals here. The Van Rensselaer family eventually received permission from the English crown to continue their uh, area called Rensselaerwick. And it basically became something like an English manor all the way up until the 19th century. And the last Van Rensselaer owner of this uh, huge chunk of the capital region in New York State was one of the richest men in the country at the time and in history, the Rensselaer family still having tons of money. So the influential Stuyvesants and Rensselaers, they just kept going along with the Schuylers and others. But even the regular old salt of the earth folk who came over from the Netherlands found their way up in this new British America and then later, of course, the United States of America. Cornelius Vanderbilt, considered by and large in every social studies classroom as the first robber baron in American history, is a descendant of these New Netherlands settlers. And he made the blueprint for what it meant to be a captain of industry in the 19th century. So Ford and Carnegie, or Carnegie, as he said his own name, Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan, they all looked to him as an example of how to be a ruthless businessman in this cutthroat age of hypercapitalism. And we can turn to politics. Like I said, the Dutch very quickly reasserted their role as being the power within New York State, especially. But on the national level, the first non-English president of the United States and the only president whose first language actually was in English was Martin Van Buren, 
from Little Kinderhook, New York. Van Buren was the political genius behind his predecessor, Andrew Jackson. And they were founders of the Democratic Party. Here we go. So New Netherland being fed into our modern day politics. Van Buren were, was one of the first people to realize that as the nation grew, and now we're talking the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s, as it rolled on, that the nation would get so big that different sections of the nation would have different politics and there had to be a new way to create national parties. Because if they didn't actively try to make huge overlapping parties, the nation would turn to fractions. It would turn into little sections. Essentially, Van Buren and others like him were sensing a civil war. And so with Jackson, we see that he's one of the founders of the Democratic Party, a party that was going to try to pull some interest from the South, some interest from the North, some interest from the West, and create a truly national party in an age of sectionalism. Van Buren went on to have his own term as president. He was a one-term president, often derided as Martin Van Ruin. A lot of the things that Jackson set up for him turned out to be miserable failures, and he had to live with them. So he was a one-term president. But after becoming president, he started the Free Soiler Party. And that party would be later folded into as one of the founding elements of the Republican Party. So here we see Martin Van Buren, first non-English president, only president whose first language was in English. Boom, a New Netherland descendant, Dutch last name, and he's a founder by one way or another of both of our major political parties today. Incredibly important man. But let's keep going with politics. So we got Van Buren out of the way. So you'd think, oh, well, the, we had a Dutch president, now we'll have other types of presidents. No, strings of English presidents. Little bits of other things, but English, 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 English. We get to the Roosevelts. Again, descendants of these Dutch settlers in New Netherland. And the Roosevelts would build themselves up to have a humongous fortune. So we have Teddy Roosevelt and we have Franklin Roosevelt. They're distantly related. They're like seventh or eighth cousins. And they were very much English themselves. They had Their families had married in a number of different times to the point where, you know, what was really Dutch about them was their last name. But nevertheless, the next time we see a non-English president, again, we see a Dutch, a Dutch last name. Uh, not a Dutch, because that doesn't make any sense. And then after that, when's the next time we see a non-English president? Well, it's another Dutchman. And so while Van Buren kind of made the blueprint for the unfolding political history of the United States from the 1820s, 30s onward, we see that the Roosevelts each drastically expanded the role of the presidency in American politics. And there are a million other examples. In fact, there's probably 30 million other examples alive today. It is difficult to estimate how many Americans today have an ancestor who made their home in New Netherland. You can't just go by who has Dutch last names or who identify as Dutch because as we learned, much of New Netherland wasn't actually Dutch. It was a whole bunch of other ethnicities who lived inside of New Netherland in relative peace. And our names are patriarchal. And so unless you have a, a father whose father, whose father, whose father, whose father, whose father was a Dutchman in New Netherland, you probably won't have a Dutch last name. Although, let's say your father's 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 mother lived in New Netherland. Well, you're, you still have that connection to New Netherland. It's just your last name might be Williamson now, or Johnson, or something very English sounding. I myself, my last name is Janus. It originally comes from the Lithuanian Jonasius which roughly just means Johnson in Lithuanian. And so my father's side is completely Lithuanian, you have no connection to New Netherland whatsoever. And yet my mother's side has this Dutch ancestry. And so I am a descendant of New Netherland. Although you wouldn't be able to tell just from the census records, just from my name, just from my declared ethnicities, you wouldn't be able to tell. And so what is the genetic heritage of New Netherland on the United States today? It's very difficult to sift out. But let's say when the English took over New Netherland, New Netherland had at most 10,000 people. And then the rest of the English colonies that would eventually become part of the United States had around 100,000. And so you're looking at a little less than 10% of the total population came from inside of these New Netherland possessions. Now this is where things get even more fuzzy. That 10% is going to have to deal with the immigration to their areas, and they're now going to be allowed to immigrate out from the, what was once New Netherland. The actual percentage of Americans today who are descendant from one 
ancestor in New Netherland might be way greater than 10%. Well, let's just say it is 10%. Well, that would take us upwards of 30 million people today. And yes, you 30 million people are incredibly important. And so New Netherland, even at the level of genes, is still shaping and working the American story as we move forward in time. I would like to do a little thought experiment. I did this with New Sweden when we ended our story on New Sweden. I said, well, one way we could tell how important New Sweden is to the history after its existence is by removing it and seeing what history would look like without it. Now, all of New Sweden fits inside of the story of New Netherland, virtually all of it. And so you can take everything from that episode and apply it to this episode, which means that if you just looked at a map, Pennsylvania probably wouldn't be where it was if it existed at all. Delaware wouldn't be there. Maryland would look a little different. New Jersey would look a little different in the southern end. The borders would be all different, and the names might be all different. And inside of that, of course, the people would be all mismatched and arranged around. So if New Sweden never existed, there would be people there who never met their spouses because they lived somewhere else instead. And then you could see how the butterfly effect ends up where, you know, there's a billion people alive today who don't exist, or a couple million at least. So the legacy of New Sweden, we could just roll into New Netherland. It's all inclusive. Now let's talk about New Netherland. Without there being a Dutch colony of New Netherland, there is no New York State. We wouldn't call it that anyway. There wouldn't be the conditions put in place whereby the territory that's now New York State would not be part of the New England colonies. If the Dutch never, never settled on the Hudson, the New England colonies would have just rolled west as fast as they possibly could and run into the Haudenosaunee. And of course, there'd be no New Netherland there for Charles II to gift to his brother, the Duke of York. And that applies to New Jersey too. So no New Netherland, there is no New Jersey. There is no New York. New England extends probably square until we get to the southern states, probably right to the border of Maryland. Whatever states would exist there today would be considered part of New England. New England would be a much larger enterprise. If you look at a map, you could see that the New England states are blocked off from the rest of the country by New York. Without a New York, without a New Netherland, New England just keeps rolling on. And so with all, just all of those changes right there, there's millions of people untold today who would never have been born and alternative people been born in their place because their great, 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 great grandfather never met their great, 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 great grandmother. You understand that. I don't need to dwell on that anymore. But let's get more specific. There's a lot of places that wouldn't exist. Peter Minuet set up the island of Manhattan, the southern tip of it, as the center of his colony, essentially. New Netherland basically was falling apart, and he took control of it and made the southern tip of Manhattan Island his uh, base of operations. Had he not done that, had that part of New Netherland history not been there, there would be no New York City. Now, there would probably be a huge city at the bottom of the Hudson River, but there's a lot of places where that could have been started and a lot of places that could have grown to become the size of New York City today. Again, Manhattan uh, was an island. If you wanted a city of millions of people, there's a lot more convenient places just nearby where that could be. The only reason Peter Minuet chose Manhattan Island, it was a little bit bigger than the island they were using beforehand, but it was still an island, so it provided some protection from the natives and other colonial powers from outside of the island. No New Netherland, there's no Manhattan settled by the Dutch. There's no New Amsterdam. There's no New York City. New England rolls in. They set up settlements. Boston probably becomes the center of commerce all the way until you get to the southern colonies. Because there, there probably wouldn't be a Pennsylvania, as we've talked about before. The Dutch and the Swedes did their best to keep the English out of that area. And it was only after the Dutch and the Swedes were captured, or not well captured, but their colonies were confiscated by the English, that the English were then able to settle that area, and, and the land was granted to William Penn. Well, geez, if there's no New Netherland, the English are going to end up in the area of what's now Pennsylvania way before William Penn comes along. And so whatever's there is not going to be Pennsylvania. And, and the history there wouldn't begin as this Quaker-controlled colony in the 1680s. It never happens. And the English Quakers had far better relations with the Native Americans than their English counterparts, and as well did the Swedish and the Dutch. Now, imagine a world without New Netherland, and the Quakers aren't where they are, and the Dutch aren't where they are, and the Swedes aren't where they were. The relations, as, as bad as they already are in the history books between the English and the Native Americans would be so much worse, especially when the English encounter the Great Iroquois Confederacy. 
Now, in this scenario, this might have tilted the Iroquois Confederacy towards allying more with the French, possibly. The ramifications on all this to this day is that there might be less n people of Native American descent alive today than in our real reality where New Netherland exists. Also, instead of the English-dominated portion of the continent extending all the way up to the southern shores of the St. Lawrence, French might be the dominant language further into uh, portions of what is now New York State. Because without New Netherland, there is no New York State. And without New Netherland, if there's still some sort of American revolution against the British, who knows where that line would be between what would now be uh, the United States of America, or whatever they would call themselves, and the British-controlled portion of North America, which would eventually become Canada. Again, if Quebec is settled into what is now the northern portion of New York, far greater than it was in our history, Canada today, or whatever they're calling it, might extend square into the southern latitudes of Lake Ontario, cutting New York in half. There, there's such a large rabbit hole we can go down with this. And it's becoming abundantly clear that you simply can't take the legacy of New Netherland out of American history. Because everything starts to crumble to a point where it's just wild speculation. It's, it's literally, this is a surgery that you cannot do. So I'm just going to kind of wrap it up here because it's, it's too much to chew. Um, another subject, the multicultural nature of the United States. The very idea of being a melting pot. If you look at the Eastern Seaboard circa 1660, you have New England full of Puritans, English Puritans, and some other groups of English. And they were very intolerant of each other, let alone other groups of people. They didn't even like other English people. They were very narrow-minded. The Southern colonies, you had lots of English people enslaving African Americans. Not very tolerant. Only in the Middle colonies do you see a huge diversity of ethnicities and languages starting to mix together, starting to go to church together, living in peace with one another, with decent relations with Native Americans, not perfect, but decent. Only there do you see the beginning of this American melting pot. It's right here in New Netherland. And with that, the traditions of secularism, the separation of church and state, grow out of New Netherland. The hyper-capitalism that would become centered around New York City and the stock market, that all grows out of New Netherland. The first stock exchange was in Amsterdam. And now the largest stock exchange today is in what was New Amsterdam, New York City. Is that a coincidence? I don't think it is. And so for the love of Santa Claus, New Netherland is important. If you're a social studies teacher, please devote some more time to it. I know such a, you have such precious time available, but New Netherland is an essential ingredient in the soup that is the United States. In our next episode, we will be turning back to the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois Confederacy, Iroquois, Iroquois Confederacy, which we haven't been to in a very long time, and there are good reasons for that. So I'm sorry to say we have reached the end of the road for New Netherland, and I'm actually pretty sad about that. I'll elaborate on that on the episode ending the season, capping it off. But until then, this has been the Other States of America History Podcast. I'm Eric Giannis, thank you for listening.